do you see more MCAS or histamine-related symptoms in people with hyperpots because of the sympathetic overactivation? You've got it. So we talk about this a lot in the office. Yes, so you're going to have more of the sympathetically mediated responses, including histamine responses, in cases where we have this autonomic hyperactivity, which I think, thank you so much for saying that. Uh, Chrissy Lee just pitching me softballs. I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, so to reiterate the point, the histamine response or the mast cell response can be is, is functionally related to sympathetic outputs, right? So the example would be um, you're going up in front of the class, giving a speech, asking a girl on a date, something that makes you nervous. You might find some people get flushed or they get redness in their skin, right? We know that they're more likely to have that when they're in that state of hyperarousal. You've probably seen that before. So if we're in that state artificially because we're not creating the normal inhibition, especially if it's at like the hypothalamic level or higher, then we're going to see that output. By the way, this is also part of why when you see those, those higher level ones, the anxiety levels go up and vigilance goes up because we affect the output um, in the arousal systems too. So the arousal systems and the sympathetic activity are not being inhibited, so we see them all come up. Um, same thing where people will notice after like a car accident, for example, in a case in my mind, um, where after a car accident, all of a sudden they never had any allergies to anything before. After the car accident, all of a sudden just allergic to the whole world, right? And then so like, what is the catalyst of that? And again, we're looking at the same thing where the inhibition of these structures is not there and everything just is hyperactive, hypersensitive. Can hyperadrenergic POTS be a maladaptive response as part of orthostatic intolerance caused by reduced upright cerebral perfusion? Great. So this is, this is flipping the question around a little bit and saying, okay, well, if we know that these neurological structures are in charge of inhibiting sympathetic output, they're the brakes, and if we pull the brakes away, it's all gas, right? But what happens if we're hypoperfused and we're not able to apply the brakes and then we get that hyperadrenergic activity as well? Absolutely. So you saw, I made it a point, like on all the wordy part to make sure I included like some of the things that cause it, which can be ischemia, or which is a reduction in blood flow, and those can be acute or chronic. So when we have those moments, this might not be something where we have an all out stroke and then we see this big example, but in the moments where we're ischemic, your brain is going to act like it's having a stroke. You guys have seen this. We see it all the time in the office, right? So somebody goes up, they get real dizzy, they start to lose their hearing, they feel like they're gonna pass out, and then they can't talk. Well, why can't they, they can't talk because that area of their brain is being perfused, or excuse me, hypoperfused. So it's acting like it happens in a stroke. So if it's doing that consistently when we're standing up, we're gonna get the same outputs where we lose control of um, the ability to create that normal, normal inhibition. So great, great question. And you can, you can see this, and this is, part of, this is a difficult part of teasing that out because we're trying to figure out chicken or the egg, but then we're also figuring out how do you try to start to think about resolving this? So do we need to do things where we're pushing blood flow to the brain more state in a more stable way first so that we can get the brain kind of online and then start to exercise the areas that would be inhibitory? That's a common choice that we make. Sometimes we have to start to exercise the areas that are inhibitory so that we can return blood to the head and reduce tachycardia, et cetera. So we think about that as well. It's like, which direction is our best window to be able to approach this from, to be able to deliver fuel to the brain and be able to exercise it in a way that it's gonna be able to tolerate. What's your opinion on the link between this and brain fog? Good, follow up to that is, for me, methylene blue has helped with brain fog. Wondering what that would indicate. Well, super happy it's helped because it's an easy application and it's, you know, marginally priced. It's pretty cheap. So that's pretty sweet that that helped for you. I'm happy to hear that. Um, 
if we're having this in brain fog, I would pull, I would probably pull back to looking at those hyper hypo perfusion type symptoms. And that would kind of be first things on my mind is how is, how is the neurology working and how is it being fed? So I don't, I don't know a history of that, but the way that I would think about it is we'd look writ large at all those different focal areas in the brain, see how they're functioning, and then overlay that against what's happening with the, um, the perfusion within the brain. And then we're just problem solving, trying to figure out what comes from what, like we just said. But I'm happy to hear that that's helping and working for you. What does it mean? Could mean a lot of things, honestly. Um, but by using it, we, we have a way to just boost some of the efficiency within the mitochondria. Things to consider is why are the mitochondria not doing very good? And then the ability to activate them. So that's a good sign that being able to activate them by just giving them a little bit of boost in that is useful. So glad to hear that. Love that it helped.